Good afternoon. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time at this uh, university. And uh, I'm very happy to meet this gentleman again. The last time that I saw him, we were at the Vatican, speaking with the Catholic Church about how to integrate social progress with poverty alleviation. He's a young global leader with the World Economic Forum. I am a social entrepreneur in that community. It's very nice to see you. Um, I will be back at the Vatican in November. Uh, one of the dialogues that I am having with the church, with a Catholic church, is how do you move from loving the poor to getting the poor out of poverty. It sounds like a joke, but it isn't. So today, I, I am very happy to be here. I'm very humbled to be here. But I would like to talk to you about four things. First, social entrepreneurship. Then I'm going to try to explain what happened to microfinance. Why is it so special or not? Then I will speak to you about my experience with education and I will end my presentation with an invention that my team and I are coming up, which is a new way to measure poverty. The reason I'm bringing these um, topics to your attention is because I would like to encourage each one of you to think of the possibility that you can change the world. Many times, many students are a little bit intimidated and they say, me? I don't have the resources, I don't have the connections. And so my message to you today is to see how you, either at the front or in the back, can change the world. Never before has there been so many low-hanging fruit in the world? Globalization has many bad things, but there are good things also. And the thing is that you can work wherever you want, doing whatever you want. So bear with me. I'm going to show you a few slides and um, share with you. Um, write down your questions. I'm going to try to go through my presentation really fast. So then we have uh, many, I want you to challenge me, I want you to not believe me, not take my word for it, because this is a university where we're trying to expand our, our brains. So um, um, this photograph are some, some uh, young farmers from my country in a school that um, um, I started a few years ago. This man was a professor, a college professor in Bangladesh. Do you know him? Anybody know him? This man, his name is Mohammed Yunus, and he is one, not the only one, one of the creators of microfinance. He discovered that street vendors in Bangladesh with no, with illiterate, no address, no assets, no, no financial statements, nothing. With a small loan of $20, $50, could buy merchandise, could increase their family income, could um, grow their businesses, could create new jobs. And what, what economists used to say, that street vendors were useless, and that we had to hold them there until factories were created so that they could be employed as factory workers, 
There are 250 million micro enterprises in the world today. A new industry has been created, which is called financial inclusion and microfinance. And a few years ago, this man was given the Nobel Prize for identifying a street vendor, a seamstress that works out of her house, a lady that um, collects garbage uh, 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 plastic and recycles, could be uh, an economic actor. So basically, what is social entrepreneurship? It has four components. Identify an unfair situation. It could be in the education field, it can be housing, it could be energy, it could be anything, right? And this is the trick. See the opportunity in that problem. When you see a drought, where is the opportunity? When you see a house that they use kerosene lamps and they're breathing that smoke, right? And a baby tied to the mother in the back and the baby smelling or, or, or inhaling that smoke as if the baby were smoking 10 packs a day. Where is the opportunity? This is something that we need to train ourselves to, right? Third, use entrepreneurial skills to transform that unjust situation into a permanent solution. I will tell you more about this. So, Social entrepreneurship is not about improving the existing system, right? You can improve the educational system in Los Angeles. You can improve uh, housing situation in Africa. That is not social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurship is creating a new system, a new system. Um, so it is not social activism either, right? More schools for the poor. No, these are a different educational system. And this is the beautiful word that I want to share with you. I don't know it's beautiful for everybody, but for what is creative destruction? Anybody? I'm sorry? And okay, what is that? That is the creative part. What is the destroying part? Yes. Would you kind of like break the older, like rules, the older, older norms, like self-assessment, like self-assessment? Like Tell me more. Tell me more. It's a beautiful word. <laughs> it's almost like breaking up with a boyfriend and finding a new one. <laughs> <laughs> Create. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So this is creative destruction. Who is this man? Henry Ford. And what's the beauty of Henry? What did he destroy? The horse and buggy. <laughs> did he shoot the horses? Did, was he mean against the horse and buggy? No. He just created something new and different and rendered the horse and buggy obsolete. Right? How many of these things can happen in our, or happened in our lifetime? <coughs> Who is this man? Bill Gates. And what did he destroy? There are many things that he destroyed. <laughs> Anybody here own a typewriter? <laughs> so there is a before and after Henry Ford. There is a before and after Bill Gates, but also Wozniak and Steve Jobs, right? This is very interesting because did he invent the automobile? Did he invent the assembly line? 
Did he invent black paint? So what did he invent? He put them together. Those were there, right? He just reassembled existing resources. Lesson for entrepreneurs, you don't have to invent anything new. Just a new way to combine existing resources. And if you're lucky, you combine existing resources and energy explodes as if it were a volcano. Did he invent the computer? No. Did he invent software? So basically, what entrepreneur, if we're talking to talk about social entrepreneur, first we must talk about entrepreneur. Social is an adjective. It's about being entrepreneur. It's about reallocating scarce resources to release trapped value. And when you see it, it's beautiful, right? You, uh, the energy, when you get the assembly line <laughs> and the, a car that we used to build by a team until they finished the car and then they built another one and they finished that car and then they built another one and the car was for the rich, just like cell phones were originally for the rich. And somebody said, no, 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 no. We're going to do it for the poor and we're going to do thousands of them a minute. This is a friend of mine who fell in love with an African woman and moved from his native Belgium to, to um, Tanzania or, 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 or Kenya. I can't remember. And when he found there, when he got there, he, he saw that they were, there were many places of the country where nobody could go because there were, there were many landmines, personal landmines of a previous conflict. And they were using, what were they using, do you think, to get rid of the landmines? Metal detectors? Dogs? And he had had hamsters when he was a little kid. And he saw that problem, he says, hey, Hamsters or rats can solve the problem. Do they eat more or less than dogs? Do, are they heavier or lighter than dogs? Can you put a little collar around them? Can you train them to smell nitrates? Okay. Now, in addition to that, he developed this to death, and then he, he applied the rats for tuberculosis. Because rats can smell tuberculosis before even the patient realizes they have it. And now he's working, I think he went back to Belgium, and he's working with his government in the port with rats figuring out who's bringing in smuggled cigarettes. <laughs> Making more money now than with these things. So entrepreneurs use innovation as their essential tool. And what is innovation? Nothing else but changing the yield of resources. What you were saying, recombining existing resources so that all of a sudden they are more productive. And this is a great story because this old man, Dr. V from India, when he retired, he said, I really want to create an eye hospital. Any Indians here? <coughs> Have you heard of this? <laughs> so that he, created a, he created a hospital with 11 beds. And he said, I really want to help people with cataracts, poor people with cataracts. And um, then he went to the United States, and he bumped into McDonald's. And he said, yes, that is the solution for eye cataracts in the world. Why do you think that happened? What did he see in McDonald's that he said, that is going to change eye health 
in the world? Drive through. Almost. <laughs> yes. What does McDonald do? Create obesity. <laughs> Fast food. And he said, that is the way to do it. That is the way to do it. So he contacted his friends with the Lions Club, and he said, I want you to go to the villages and find me cataract patients who are too poor. I'm, and I want you to line them up, line them up in 11 beds. And I will have one doctor, and we're going to move the beds. So the doctor, it takes about 15 minutes. Apparently, you do a little incision, you take away the cataract intra, intra uh, uh, the, I don't know what it is, the intraocular lens, put an artificial intraocular lens and two stitches. Okay? Next, zik. Next, one doctor in a very efficient way. So he, he did operations with an assembly line. And he completely revolutionized, right? And then he met David Green, an entrepreneur from the United States that was backpacking. And he said, how much do these intraocular lens cost? A hundred dollars manufactured in the United States. Nah, they can't cost that much. So he established a factory to, to manufacture intraocular lens in India for four dollars. Four dollars. They were charging a hundred. So with his manufacturing plants of inexpensive, high-quality intraocular lens and Dr. V's um, way of having one, one doctor um, move through many, so many, many patients, the rich people started coming to the hospital. So for, because the rich people, you want to go to a, a, a surgeon that has a lot of experience, right? Something that has, how many have you operated? Oh, I, I, do, I did um, 3,000 last year. Oh, I want you to operate me, right? So he created a hybrid model whereby rich patients come, they are charged what it costs, right? And with that money, they get to operate too poor for free. Not bad, huh? Thanks to McDonald's. Aravind Eye Hospital is the biggest eye hospital in the world. Dedicated for the poor. Thanks to McDonald's. What I'm trying to say here is that don't underestimate <laughs> what is around us. Good organizational skills, capacity to scale, and a good team. I'll get back to this later. And this is Bunker Roy, a person who discovered in India that uh, the big problem was um, electricity, right? Light. Um, and he created Barefoot College, whereby he educates completely illiterate women to be solar engineers, to be able to assemble solar panels for their homes. Everybody said it was impossible. How are you going to train a person who can't read and write? He figured it out. And today, Barefoot College is an example of social entrepreneurship in Rajasthan that has influenced the world. So problems are opportunities. I want you to make a list of all the unfair problems that you see around you and think, where is the opportunity here and where is the money? Because they did find the money for Aravind Eye Hospital. They did find the money to, to lift antipersonal minds. So social entrepreneurship is about innovation and impact, and it is not about money. It is not about nonprofits making money either, although you can have um, Two concepts, value creation and value appropriation. Value appropriation would be a private company keeping the surplus, and value creation is another company that is giving it back to society. We can talk about this later. 
And, and of course, a social enterprise is a social mission organization that generates income to cover its costs through the sale of a good or a service, right? So the Aravind Eye Hospital is a social enterprise. There are for-profit hospitals and not-for-profit hospitals. But not-for-profit hospitals still have to have a surplus. Profit is not being bankrupt or not. Profit is what is distributed among the owners. So there's a difference between surplus, which is the excess money that you have after paying costs, right? And profit. And so there are many things, um, and social entrepreneurship is where these two circles, um, where these two circles uh, join. Uh, we're gonna get into this later. But I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story. When I was mayor of my capital city in, 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 in Paraguay, um, we had a lot of, uh, of, of factories and, because uh, we were a big beef produ producing country, right? Huge beef, and we're, we're very proud of that. In fact, two years ago, we exported more than Argentina, which for us is like, <laughs> any Argentinians here? Because we won the game against you in Argentina two days ago. Um, and this is what we have because they hose down the slaughterhouses after every day, and, and this is what we have in the river. Classical, my country, classical. So then, this is what happens, right? <coughs> Typical, contaminated, people have no education, they don't know what to do, and then we created a blood factory. This is called Lee Khan Inc. And this company now buys the contaminated water from the slaughterhouses before they take it to, they, they throw it away. Why would anybody want bloody water? Any Chinese here? They export it to China. What does bloody water have? Blood, right? <laughs> and what does blood have? It has hemoglobin and plasma. So they, get the, they go to the slaughterhouses, they get the water before it's taken to the, um, to, the, to the stream, they dehydrate it, and they get the powder red plasma, they separate it from the hemoglobin, and they export it as a food uh, helper or whatever, for animal feed or things like that. And with the money, we clean the, the, the river, and we are making a fund to save the jaguars in Paraguay. The Nature Conservancy Foundation, with whom I work, received $750,000 cash from their 50% or 49% investment in that factory to save the thing. So you can have a problem, and you can convert it into an opportunity. And, it, and entrepreneurship has to do with risk, because all these things are very risky. As I'm sure you know, everything is very risky, because you can lose a lot of money if you miscalculate. And usually you will lose a lot of money until you, you, you hit it. And so this is the type of people I work with. And um, the beauty of social entrepreneurship is that you get to rebaptize this person or anything. So she was rebaptized. What was she called before? Street vendor, fruit vendor. How many years have there been fruit vendors in the world? The Hanging Gardens of Babylonia, was she there? Yeah. The, Egypt, the pyramids in Egypt, did they have one lady selling? Yes. 
She's been there forever. And 40 years ago, she was rebaptized. And she was called what? What's her name now? Micro Enterprise. <laughs> right? And with that change of name, a banking system was invented. You can sell them a loan. You can sell them insurance. You can sell them savings account. Just that you have to, instead of being a bank that does loans of $5,000 or, or less, you learn how to do loans for $50. and just adjusting the scale. So I work with very poor, poor people, and this is a young woman with whom I work. His name is Marisol. Look at her house. Look at that dog. Pretty bad, huh? So we create, so the thing is, how do you educate this poor woman that, who cannot pay tuition in a poor country where there are, there are no schools? There are no good schools. So we, uh, or this, <laughs> what is the problem here? What are, there are many problems here, but what problem do you see? This is Jorge Guerrero. The, yes? You don't have what? Enough clothes. Enough clothes? What else? Too many children, but what is the problem with that? There are many visible and invisible problems. The problem is that she does not get to go to school because mom asks her to take care of the baby. Typical poor country. Girls are, uh, you will not go to school because the boys need to go to school. You take, help me at the house, right? So how do you create a school for, 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 for this type? And so basically, you know this saying, Chinese, raise your hands again one more time. Give a man to fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach him how to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime. So we created a school that has uh, the theory in classroom. And we also have micro enterprises on campus where they apply the theory, right? They learn entrepreneurship skills. They work in the field. They produce many different things on campus. Have solar energy, biodigesters. They learn how to sell what they produce. And when they graduate, it's a free school that generates $750,000 a year. No government subsidies, no tuition from the sale of cheese, from the rural hotel, vegetables. And this is Marisol. Free. So combining things that already were there, you generate resources. And this is not the only way but also one way in which people overcome poverty and they join the middle class. Middle class people love proms. <laughs> right? Poor people know. Poor people don't know what it is. Right? And when you start having a young woman wanting to be middle class, although you and I can think it's corny or ridiculous, right? but when you have so what we were thinking is, what happens in her brain when she goes from living in that rancho to this? What's happening in her spirit, in her brain? How can we do it on a massive scale? What, how do people who are born in the wrong zip code, because that's basically what it is, right? We were all lucky. We were just born in the right zip code, right? And you were born in the wrong zip code. You're... And now she's a professional working in a company as a saleswoman. And Jorge is a young entrepreneur. He's actually a teacher at a school. And so we have a network of schools like this throughout the world. And so... 
in our in our in our um, through our work in microfinance and education, we start saying, why are some people poor and some other people not poor? So quickly, why does it, is not having teeth an element of poverty? Why doesn't she have teeth? Yes. No access to hygiene, okay. That's good. Give me another reason. Yes. There's no dental hospital or, or clinic, right? What else? Yes. She doesn't have any money. Or it's too expensive. Right. What else? Yes. Can you repeat that? So we found, I met this psychologist called Ken Wilbur, and he said, Martin, there is something called integral theory where you can organize all these things because they are all true. <laughs> so is it her behavior? Raise your hand. She doesn't, keep, she doesn't take care of her teeth. Or is it the, 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 the medical system? Both of which are external, right? You can see, right? It's either she does not take care of her teeth or, because, or she cannot, or there's no dental clinic to go to. But there are two things that you and I cannot see, but exist. Can you repeat what you said? Yes. Yes. Where does that fit? Is it this? Is it that? Is it possible that she is afraid of going to the dentist? So, and no matter how many dental clinics there are that she won't go? Yeah. Or for example, let's say that she is a young pregnant mother and she will not go to the existing health system because she's afraid. Is that possible? So culture is uh, int personal intention is important, right? You can have all the money in the world, but if... And what about culture? In my country, if you're a 20-year-old girl, it is very important to have beautiful teeth. But if you're a 70-year-old lady, it's not that important. Because they want to get married and things like that. But for an older lady, uh, it is, there are ladies like that. So it depends on the, cult on, the lo on the local culture. So what are poor people? Are poor people empty bottles where we have to fill with resources? Or are they... Or do they have everything inside them and your role and my role is to rub Aladdin's lamp so that the wealth comes from out? Because it depends on who you think the poor are to develop strategies, right? If you think that this is the solution, then you and I are going to create a lot of funnels, right? To give resources to the poor, right? But if you believe that the poor have potential, then you develop another strategy. We are experimenting. We are a poor country. So we don't have that many resources here. So we are experimenting with this paradigm, with this idea. What if the poor were not poor? What if the poor Poor had money. And what if money was not the problem? So we're experimenting with this. And we are saying, well, when we talk about um, poverty, 
there are like two, two ideas, right? Economic growth, right? Build, build factories, build roads, build dams, and there will be job creation, right? Or then there is poverty alleviation to help the suffering. What is the elephant in the room? I love that expression. That we don't have it in my country. We don't even have elephants either. But <laughs> here, it's an American. What, what is the... What's the elephant in the room? Yes. People, people, people. Oh, Who? Uh, well, the poor. Um, possibly not everybody doesn't break out of a poverty mentality, so they maintain their cultural. So, the, are the are the poor involved in the poverty alleviation? Who's that? Government, right? Yeah. And over there, companies and huh? So where are the poor over there? Well, they're, the recipients. they're the recipients. So when you develop a, str a poverty strategy, do they... What is the... What, what, I love that expression. Can, help me out here. What is the elephant in the room? You said it. The poor. The poor are not invited to draft the... The policies, why not? They're illiterate. What else? Why are, yes? So the people that make the policies are the, the rich people. You and me, and? Well, I'm not rich, but. Well, well, we will, we, <laughs> not yet. Okay, and, and what's the, what, okay, what's the problem? Yes. Who's they? They. The poor. Right. So the poor are in generally not qualified. Is that it? That's the idea? What if they were? What if, what if we were mistaken all this time and the poor are not poor? What if we changed and said... What if we, instead of considering the poor individuals, we consider them as a family? And what if we not just alleviate, what if we said, what would poverty elimination mean in the United States of America? What, what does that mean? How, how many? In what? Anybody here believe that we will see this in this generation? Why not? Too big? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anybody? I think there's a lot of factors, but then why do you have PhDs who end up on the street and homeless and poor? You know what I mean? So behavior? Yeah. System? Culture? It's complicated. So what we are saying is let's pretend that we are going to eliminate poverty. What would it take? And so the first thing we found out was the way we measure poverty. They're all indexes. The poverty index here, the multidimensional pov uh, poverty index there, the social pro Why index? We are here in our university. Why do we use indexes? What is an index for? To do what? to compress, right, all this information, right? And you create, you aggregate, right? And who, who needs indexes? Policy makers. To, to, for what? To make decisions. Are there other decision makers in the poverty? We know that policy makers are decision makers. Are there other decision makers? Activists. Activists? Who are other decision makers in poverty? The elephant. The <laughs> Does the mother 
Is a mother a decision maker with what her, if the kids are going to get vaccinated? Is she a big decision maker whether her daughter is going to graduate from high school? She is a major decision maker. But the indexes are not for her. Right? Because so what we are finding with poverty, that poverty for policy making is aggregated. But if we disaggregate poverty into little pieces, each one of this can be solved and eliminated. So can we find a way of aggregating data for certain purposes and disaggregating it to the maximum so that the poor can get themselves out of poverty? And so what is poverty? Is it income? Right? It's money, right? But is it only money? Employment, right? Health. Education. Is, are, is it important that the poor be organized? Is it important that they participate in their community and in the, right? Is interiority important? Self-esteem, violence, autonomy, are these things important? Is it easy to measure? Should we eliminate them or not? because they're difficult to measure. We have to solve it. <laughs> not because self-esteem, that is self-esteem important or not to get out of poverty? So it, we better have it there. Is it easy for us to measure? But we still have to figure it out. And what we have done with these six dimensions is that we have separated them into 50 indicators. And so awareness, I am aware of my personal needs and I have personal goals. I am, there is violence in my house or not. I have electricity. I have capacity to address and solve problems. These are all with, that we, by consulting, with the poor and also by reading the literature, we came up with these 50 indicators. And for each, we're working with very poor women in the neighborhoods. We're working within companies in the factories. We are working in remote parts of uh, Nigeria. Is this house a poor house? Excuse me? Oh, there is a local standard. Raise your hands if we believe that there's a local standard. Raise your hand if you believe we should sort of consult with the people there. Are we cheating the poor in allowing them to have this house? No. This is, this, this, this leader, he is, um, this is a, a Muslim town in northeastern Nigeria affected by the Boko Haram uh, terrorist group. Very near here, the Chibok girls were, were, were kidnapped. I don't know if you heard about that. They went into a school and they, with buses and they kidnapped 400 gir young girls. This is, you know, very serious, right? And so we're working there with them. And, and doing field work and office work, right? What does it mean not to be poor in northeast, northeast, northeastern Nigeria? Do you think they know? Yes. Do, they think, do you think they know in terms of water, in terms of Naira, the local currency, in terms of electricity, in terms of transportation, in terms of education, in terms of health? They know everything. They know everything, just like people in Los Angeles know everything. And they know that babies get burned when there are li uh, live charcoal there, right? They know. And they know that this is a problem when the goat licks this spoon that the baby is going to lick later. 
and we are working in Newcastle, England with organizations such as Transmit, Enterprise, or YMCA. Do they know, is there poverty in Newcastle? Do they know what poverty is? Is it different from Nigeria? From Los Angeles? Are there poor people potentially living in those apartments? Could there be 10 people living in one apartment? So what we have developed, and this is where all this is possible, what we have developed is a visual survey, a visual survey whereby for each indicator there is a red definition, very poor, a yellow definition, poor, and a green definition, not poor. And when you select something, you go to the next one, for example, stable income. And in 20 minutes, in 20 minutes, people in England or in Nigeria can self-diagnose their level of poverty. This is the English, right? We have one for Brazil, we have one for Ecuador, we have one for South Africa. And in 20 minutes, what do you think is important? That I go and interview her and figure out what kind of house she has and whether she has a self-esteem or, or do I let her self do I let her? Yes. Is it valuable that she self-diagnose? Why? The change comes from within. Okay. Why else is it important? Can I measure her self-esteem? Can she measure her self-esteem? If the questions are well, right? Huh? Autonomy, you know? Self-esteem. Sometimes, uh, self-esteem, red. I never feel that I can do new projects because I don't have any trust in myself. Red, right? Sometimes I start with new projects, but then I get discouraged. Yellow. I am always ready to embark in new projects because I feel stronger. Can she, how long does it take her for her to decide? How many seconds? Five seconds. And so technology today allows us, can I, geo, can I use, geo, can I geo-reference her home? Can I take a picture? Can I combine? And what we do is, for example, this is my country. So you go, what type of water do you have, lady? And she, right? But this is Nigeria, right? So what is... Poor in my country to have a well in rural Nigeria near the Sahara Desert, <laughs> right? This is not poor. And this is England. And you combine all the information, you start seeing patterns, and you can geo reference it. And that blue is where the government thinks the village is. <laughs> and what people keep is this. After they finish the, the tablet, they fill out this, their dashboard. And this is life changing because they do this. They do their personalized and customized way of what their priorities are and what they're going to they're, they're going to do it to get out. I'm going to lend you take a look. Take a look, but uh, what does it say here? We don't have violence in the family. Uh, we concern others in decision making. We have enough income and we have safety. What is more important? Autonomy, savings, income or violence? No Take a look. Thank you. Um, very quickly, very quickly. So, after people measure, they, in order for people to fix their teeth, to make more money, to go to get an education, we think 
that they have to answer two questions. Is it worth it and can I do it? This is a, a, a psychologist from Stanford University called Albert Bandura. This is agency and self-efficacy. Okay, And we think that to get out of poverty, the, we have to have a strategy of these six things for each indicator. And we develop a strategy for each one of the indicators. And sometimes people are not poor in money, but poor in other things. <laughs> right? This is the dashboard of a, of, a, of a family, right? In terms of income and employment, she's green in everything, right? But she has a... They have money. Father, mother, the two daughters work but they had that bathroom. So how do you convince a non-poor person who has money, but who lives, who has this outhouse, or it can be the, the, any equivalent here in Los Angeles, to move to that? We are experimenting with competitions. <laughs> we're experimenting with many things, but one of the things is that we're experimenting with competitions so that people can do from this to that. And um, we put $5,000 in prizes, $100 prizes, $200 prizes, and we achieved $180,000 in home improvements with money that the poor had. This was not a problem of money. It was not a problem of money. When there is a conviction, money appears. I'm exaggerating, but we have seen it. And now we have 10 competitions. This is one of the competitions. Do you see that picture up there? The competition is called My Happy Smile. And look at her. How do we change behavior and change the system to make these things happen? We are having a student, a high school student competition, who gets their parents out of poverty first? There is nothing more powerful than a 16-year-old girl that wants to win a competition in my country. She is going to drive her parents crazy. And so, find, and, and we find, we, we, we work with limited uh, indicators, find a family member that has a savings account, interview a family member about their savings strategies, find a family member that has health insurance, family budget, find a family example of more than one source of income, create a budget for your family. Um, we're also, um, and this is how um, companies start moving. For example, these are native Paraguayans. This is the poverty affecting our, our Indian population. And these are young farmers. And this is what tends to happen. This is one, one company. Do you see how in one year the greens start moving? This is a mattress factory with 60 employees. This was one year one, year two. Do you see? And uh, we have done some econometric studies. This is a, um, um, two, uh, we, we found one treatment group and one comparison group. And um, they, were, they were the blues. We did to the blues the poverty stoplight and not, and not to the reds. We, um, and we found that um, statistically, uh, after controlling for many factors, People who do the poverty stoplight tend to get out of poverty quicker and more than people who have it. Or um, a difference in difference, a comparative of poverty indexes uh, controlling for other factors. Um, we have also, we are also analyzing the robustness of this, whether it's valid, whether it's reliable, whether it's practical. 
And we are, we are working. Uh, we still have uh, some, some, some things to solve. Among other things, um, when you have red, yellow, and green, there are certain things th that statistically you cannot do. But we're, we're getting there. Um, this is where, where we think that our relationship with uh, University of California at Irvine can help us in solving some of the technological uh, problems that we have, some of the statistical uh, problems that we have. Um, so in conclusion, can I be a social entrepreneur? Raise your hand. Yes. A little bit more conviction, please. <laughs> Has anybody read the book The Element by Ken Robinson? Ken Robinson says you have to find your element there where you, what you love to do intersects what you're good at. What does a heart have to do with it? Find love. Find somebody that loves you and that you can love. You have to be surrounded by people who love you. And try to get away from people who don't love you. Because they're going to take away all the energy. What does this mean? Find your tribe. It doesn't even have to be here at Irvine. It, it can be anywhere. <laughs> But hang out with the people that you love to be around and that love to be around you. And um, this was, this is a, Guat any Guatemalans here? Over here. Jaime Vinales, you know him? Sorry. Tell me, what, what is it? Um, he has climbed most of the highest points around the world. He's a guy like this. And I said, you? Me. <laughs> what do you think was the secret? This is the most incredible. Guatemala, he has been to every single high mountain in the world. From Guatemala. <laughs> what is the secret? He said, never aim to the top. I said, what? How did you get to Mount Everest? Never aim to the top. So, just to the next base camp. <laughs> so you get here, it says, tomorrow, I don't have to get to the top, because that's very intimidating. I just need to go to the next tent <laughs> and sleep. And when I get there, the next day, I get there. So basically, that's my, um, my recommendation to you. Any person can make a difference. You can be the social entrepreneur at some times, but sometimes you can work with a, with a social entrepreneur. It doesn't, you don't have to be in the front all the time, all the time. And remember that you are standing on the shoulders of giants. There are so many people that have done so many things before you, but when you get up there, you will have a great advantage. You will have a great advantage. And so this is what I would recommend to you. Embrace love. Embrace challenges. When a friend says, oh, I hate this problem. More respect. I'm going to find the opportunity in this problem. Thank you very much.